we're living in anxious times, and I don't hear anyone saying otherwise. Many feel utterly overwhelmed and powerless against the flood of anxiety that fills our hearts, our minds, our news feeds, and our social media communities. Two weeks ago, my latest book, A Non-Anxious Life, was released. Now, the more I talk with leaders about soul hurry, the more I realize that a very common variety of it is anxiety. I know anxiety has driven a lot of my own work over the years. That kind of busyness may look impressive, but it hasn't borne good, lasting fruit. Welcome to the Unhurried Living Podcast. Did you know that you can join a community of fellow listeners to this podcast who are hungry to grow deeper in the unhurried way of Jesus? There's nothing quite like having a group of like-minded friends with whom to share the journey. We call this group Unhurried Leaders, and we meet in a live Zoom each month to talk about various facets of living and leading unhurried. We now have four years of archived monthly recordings that can resource your spiritual journey. I would love to have you join this growing online community of men and women. It's one of my most encouraging hours each month. To learn more and to join this group, please visit unhurriedliving.com slash unhurried leaders. That's unhurriedliving.com slash unhurried leaders, all one word. Welcome to the podcast. If you're new here, I'm glad you found us. If you haven't already, please consider subscribing so you won't miss an episode. And we'd love if you'd talk about this podcast with your friends and colleagues. In the first chapter of A Non-Anxious Life, I mentioned six faces of anxiety that have helped me right-size it in my imagination and in my way of living and working. Too often, I've assumed my anxiety was an inevitable part of how I functioned rather than a way of living and working that could be transformed. Let me share those six faces, and you can read more about them in the book. So first, anxiety has been like an operating system. When I was a freshman in high school, our math club was given a computer kit to literally assemble part by part. It was an MSI 8080 kit. It was one of the first microcomputers, and yes, I was one of those cool math club kids. Now, there was no keyboard. The computer was programmed using hexadecimal codes entered through a series of flipped switches. There wasn't much of a practical nature that you could do with that little computer. Now today, our computers have robust, intricate operating systems that you and I never have to understand, but it provides a foundation for amazing apps and other programs that we use every day. Those operating systems function under the radar for most of us, and few of us understand how they work. What I realized as I was writing this book is that anxiety has often functioned like an operating system in my life from my earliest childhood memories. It was ever present, providing a kind of underlying base on which I built my life. It drove my work as a student, my learning to play the guitar, and eventually my work as a pastor. I don't have to tell you how incongruent an anxiety operating system is for church leadership. As I've often said, Jesus is probably right about how ineffective and unproductive anxiety actually is. But that didn't stop me from autopiloting a lot of my work on an anxiety base. What I've discovered is that it is possible for peace to replace anxiety as our default operating system. We can learn to let the Prince of Peace be at the center of our assumptions, expectations, and beliefs rather than anxiety. It's a worthy upgrade. Second, 
my anxiety has been a not so wonderful counselor. Every time we come through Advent and Christmas, we are refreshed in our awareness that Jesus comes as a Prince of Peace and Everlasting Father, our Mighty God, and first in Isaiah's list, a Wonderful Counselor. No one is a better guide than Jesus is. Walking with Him and working with Him is having the best possible counsel at hand in our every moment. Anxiety, on the other hand, also wants to be my counselor. It claims to have insightful advice about my present and my future. It claims to have insight about what is going to happen down the road based on the unexpected or the unpleasantly surprising in my present moment. I've said that the degree to which I've listened to the advice of anxiety over the years, you'd think I considered it a primary mentor. But the counsel of anxiety is not at all that wonderful. It assumes scarcity while the kingdom of God operates in abundance. Anxiety wants to hurry me. Peace slows me down. I've been grateful to learn how to downsize the authority of anxiety in my life and my work and to refocus my attention on the truly wonderful counselor that Jesus is in my life. Instead of trusting the advice anxiety gives with such urgency, I learned that my wonderful counselor gives guidance that is much more spacious, gracious, and peaceful. Third, anxiety is like an anxious squirrel. Now, I love cycling here in Orange County, California, where I live. The weather cooperates most of the year. But let me share one experience I do not enjoy much on the bike trail. I'll be riding along enjoying this scenery when a squirrel will dart out in front of me just missing becoming a squirrel pancake by about 12 inches. I'll then feel a jolt of adrenaline that feels like anxiety at full volume. I mean, I have to wonder if these little guys have a death wish. I imagine them daring each other to jump out in front of those big rolling things that are racing by. Now, actually, I think I know what's happening. They hear me coming, and it sounds like danger. In reaction, their little squirrel brain urges them to find safety. Go home! Well, except that it always seems like their home is on the other side of the bike trail. So the instinct to race home puts them in more danger than if they took a moment to see what they were hearing and decide on the best course of action. That would be to stay put. But they don't seem to understand that. My anxiety is a lot like this squirrel instinct. Something shocks me or threatens me and I go into self-protection mode. Get safe is what my security-seeking brain cries out. But if I don't take a moment to look around, I may put myself in the way of greater harm by operating in the tunnel of anxiety. I really hope I'm smarter than an anxious squirrel. Fourth, anxiety is like a broken warning light. Jim and I have worked in the nonprofit world most of our adult lives. For nearly 20 years, I served on the staff of a local church as a youth pastor, a college pastor, a family pastor, or some other associate pastor position. Since 1998, we've served religious nonprofit organizations focused on spiritual formation and leadership development. The most recent eight years have been under the umbrella of unhurried living. Now, nonprofits are largely funded by the generous donations of faithful partners, and one of the kinds of donations we received in the early years of this work were used vehicles. One of our current cars would often be one of those vehicles. They were usually older model cars in their last season of life. One day, the red check engine light came on as one of our sons was driving. 
We took the old car to our mechanic to have him figure out what was wrong. A few days later, he called to say that he had run every diagnostic he could think of, but nothing resolved the check engine light. His opinion was that the computer itself was probably malfunctioning and that replacing it on such an old vehicle was not worth the cost. So what did he recommend? He said that we would simply continue driving the car for as long as we'd own it with that light stuck on. We'd have to get used to a warning light that was wrong. I think the red light indicator of my own habitual anxiety is like that check engine light. It comes on, and often it stays on, and it warns me of some major problem that may not even exist. It claims to be warning me of a problem, but it may itself be the problem. Fifth, anxiety is like attempting time travel. My anxiety rarely has me living in the present moment. It wants me to use the present to worry about the past or about the future. Anxiety has me ruminating about something that has already happened or projects doomsday scenarios about what will probably happen in the near or distant future. In other words, anxiety invites me to do the impossible. I can't live a past moment again. I can't live a future moment in advance. I can only live in the present. Grace and peace are only present to me here and now. And anxiety doesn't much like that sort of security or well-being. It much prefers that I live insecure and in a scarcity orientation. That's just not what the kingdom of God is like, though. Anxiety pretends to be a prophet predicting the future. But as many times as anxiety has got things wrong, it's a false prophet. It really is a good thing that I'm learning how to turn my attention away from the frantic advice of anxiety and instead turn it toward the peaceful counsel of Jesus. Finally, anxiety works very much like a conspiracy theory. A conspiracy theory is rooted in how enticing it is to have inside knowledge that most other people don't have. We know something that most people don't know. Any evidence that supports the conspiracy is trusted and embraced. Any evidence that contradicts the theory is rejected as part of of the conspiracy. Anxiety does this. It claims to have evidence about how bad the future will be, some present or unpleasant uh, surprise is inevitably going to lead to disastrous outcomes if we don't frantically worry and ruminate and find a way to take control of the future. Control like that isn't actually possible. But that doesn't bother anxiety very much. Now, the love of God and the grace of Christ and the communion of the Holy Spirit breaks into these constrictive conspiracy loops and frees us to live in peace and well-being. Anxiety boasts great wisdom, but anxiety is wrong on so many counts. Here are a few statements that are much more true than the sort that anxiety makes. Jesus will never leave me and will never desert me. I have a very good shepherd who is always with me. I'm not going to find myself in a situation of desperate want. Goodness and mercy is going to follow me every step of the path ahead. And that same good shepherd will provide for me even in the presence of my enemies. No conspiracy theory of anxiety can do any of these things for me. These six faces of anxiety have been a helpful way for me to right-size its presence in my life. I've learned that 
Jesus really is right about how unproductive and unhelpful my anxious worry is. I have a Father in heaven who cares for me even more than he cares for the creation that surrounds me. I am special because I belong to him. Bad things will happen, but I'm not alone in them. God is always with me even when I struggle to discern his presence. Anything I could do driven by anxiety, I could do a lot better led by peace. You've been listening to the Unhurried Living Podcast. Join me next time to learn more about following the genius of Jesus' unhurried way of life and leadership.